to another episode of Leaving the Farm right here on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. We are also simulcasting tonight on No Borders Radio at nobordersradio.co.uk and as well as on tiernasor.com. We are a listener-supported radio station. And if you'd like to donate, please visit us at www.freedomslips.com and click on our support pages. Every little bit helps. Tonight, I think we're going to go into national security because there's this uh, illusion or this presumption that's allowing national security to take precedence over state security. And this refers, of course, to the citizen or human being as a state or of a state and is defined in their own statutes. So I'll just start. Now, Texas this week, a Bow National Guard commander charged in Texas sex trafficking case. Oh, everybody listens to me knows that Texas is a hub and one of the uh, major profiteers is Rick Perry himself traded as the Department of Health and Human Services as well as the General Counsel on Dun & Bradstreet. All of these things are sewn up and uh, tightened up, buttoned up in adherence to national security. This is from the ConcordMonitor.com. A New Hampshire National Guard commander who led an infantry unit in Iraq and co-founded the state's first hurling team, the Barley House Wolves, has been arrested and charged with child sex trafficking. Lieutenant Colonel Raymond Vallis, 41 of Bow, was charged last was arrested last week in New York on federal indictment out of San Antonio, Texas. The charge stems from an unspecified incident last August when Vallis was in San Antonio after a four-month humanitarian mission he oversaw in El Salvador. The indictment does not specify what role Vallis allegedly played in the trafficking. Two other men, both of San Antonio, have been equally charged in the case. Vallis's attorney, John Convery of San Antonio, said it had been reported locally that Vallis had sex with an underage prostitute. Now that's an oxymoron in itself, isn't it? Conbury said he had no further information about the allegations. He has yet to meet with Vallis, who is being held in New York pending transfer to Texas. Quote, I think based on the allegation, the question is whether or not she, not whether she was underage, Conbury said. The question is what he knew. In an order last week denying bail, a judge in Syracuse wrote that Vallis had proffered that he did not know the child was a minor. Federal minimum prison sentence for sex trafficking a child is 10 years, 15 if the child is under 14. Quote, if this were a simple case of prostitution, it would be a county misdemeanor, Converse said. Vallis has been studying at the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism, based at Syracuse University in New York, said Lieutenant Colonel Greg Hellshorn, a spokesman for the New Hampshire National Guard. He had been scheduled to return to New Hampshire a week after his arrest. Hellshorn said Vallis' security clearance has been revoked pending the outcome of the case. Vallis was commissioned in 1995 through the Reserve Officers Training Corps at the University of New Hampshire. He deployed in 2004 with the New Hampshire National Guard C Company, 3rd Battalion of the 172nd Infantry, based in Manchester. The unit returned in 2005, after which Vallis established the Wolves in an effort to help his men adjust to life post-combat. The team, sponsored by the Barley House and Concord, still exists. Today it includes members of local law enforcement, fire department, as well as civilians. Last year, Vallis led about 40 men on a four-month humanitarian mission to western El Salvador, during which they built schools and performed other construction and repair projects. Halshorn said the operation was overseen by U.S. Army South, which is headquartered in San Antonio. Converse said that Vallis has a wife and children who live in New Hampshire. 
He also said his phone had been ringing on off the hook with support from Vallis's friends and fellow infantrymen. So why don't we go to uh, the National Security Study Memo of 200 by Henry Kissinger to the National Security Council, 1974. Dr. Henry Kissinger proposed in his memorandum to the NSC that depopulation should be the highest priority of U.S. foreign policy towards the third world. He quoted reasons of national security because the, quote, U.S. economy will require large and increasing amounts of minerals from abroad, especially from less developed countries. Whenever a lessening of population can increase the prospects for such stability, population policy becomes relevant to resources, supplies, and to the economic interests of the United States Incorporated. The targeting agency for the operation is the National Security Council's ad hoc group on population policy. Its policy planning group in the United States State Department's Office of Population Affairs was established in 1975 by Dr. Henry Kissinger. The, the Office of Population Affairs is the Health and Human Services Department of this government entity. Part of national security, of course, is capacity building. Capacity building means doing whatever is necessary to make a human being produce. Traumatization, shock doctrine implication makes children produce effectively for a corporate body. Under 28 U.S.C. subsection 1603, a definition of foreign state. A. Foreign state except as used in section 1608 of this title includes a political subdivision of a foreign state or an agency or instrumentality of a foreign state as defined in subsection B. B. An agency or instrumentality of a foreign state means any entity, one, which is a separate legal person, corporate or otherwise, and two, which is an organ of a foreign state or political subdivision thereof, or a majority of whose shares or other ownership interests is owned by a foreign state or political subdivision thereof, and three, which is neither a citizen of a state of the United States, as defined in section 1332, C, and E of this title, nor created under the laws of any third country. C. The United States includes all territory and waters, continental or insular, subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. D. Commercial activity means either a regular course of commercial conduct or a particular commercial transaction or act. The commercial character of an activity shall be determined by reference to the nature of its course of conduct or particular transaction of, or act rather than by reference to its purpose. A commercial activity carried on in the United States by a foreign state means commercial activity carried on by any such state and having substantial contact with the United States Incorporated. Let's see here. So the 1947 National Security Act, July 26, 1947. Public Law 253, 80th Congress, Chapter 343, First Session, Section 758, an act to promote the national security by providing for a Secretary of Defense for a national military establishment for a Department of the Army, a Department of the Navy, and a Department of the Air Force, and for the coordination of the activities of the national military establishment and other departments and agencies of the government concerned with national security. Be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled. Short title. This act may be cited as the National Security Act of 1947. Table of Contents, Direct Declaration of Policy, Title I, Coordination for National Security, Section 101, National Security Council, Section 102, Central Intelligence Agency, Section 103, National Se Security Resources Board, Title II, the National Military Establishment, Two, Section 201, National Mid Military Establishment, Secretary of Defense, Military Assistance to the Secretary, Civilian Personnel, Departments of the Army, Department of the Navy, Department of the Air Force, United States Air Force, Effective Date of Transfers, War Council, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Joint Staff, Munitions Board, Research and Development Board, Title III, Miscellaneous Establishment of Compensation of Secretaries, Undersecretaries, and Assistant Secretaries, 
advisory committees and personnel, status of transferred civilian personnel, saving provisions, transfer of funds, authorization of appropriations, definition, separability, effective date, succession to the presidency. Declaration of Policy, Section 2. In enacting this legislation, it is the intent of Congress to provide a comprehensive program for the future security of the United States Incorporated, to provide for the establishment of integrated policies and procedures for the departments, agencies, and functions of the government relating to the national security, to provide three military departments for the operation and administration of the Army, the Navy, including Naval Aviation and the United States Marine Corps and the Air Force with their assigned combat and service components to provide for their author authoritative coordination and unified direction under civilian control, but not to merge them, to provide for the effective strategic direction of the armed forces and for the operation under unified control of their and for their integration into an effective team of land, naval, and air forces. Title I, Coordination for National Security. National Security Council, Section 101. There is hereby established a council to be known as the National Security Council here and after in this section referred to as the Council. The President of the United States Incorporated shall preside over meetings of the Council, provided that in his absence he may designate a member of the Council to provide in his, preside in his place. The function of the Council shall be to advise the President with respect to the integration of domestic, foreign, and military policies related to the national security so as to enable the military services and other departments and agencies of the government to cooperate more effectively in matters involving the national security. The Council shall be comprised of the President, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and appointed under Section 202, the Secretary of Army, referred to in Section 205, the Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of the Air Force, appointed under Section 207, the Chairman of the National Security Resources Board, appointed under Section 103, and such of the following named officers as the President may designate from time to time, the Secretaries of the Executive Departments, the Chairman of the Munitions Board, appointed under Section 213, and the Chairman of the Research and Development Board, appointed under Section 214. But no such additional member shall be designated until the advice and consent of the Senate has been given to this appointment to the office of the office, the holding of which authorizes his designation as a member of the Council. In addition to performing other, such other function as the President may direct, for the purpose of more effectively coordinating the policies and functions of the departments and agencies of the government relating to the national security, it shall, subject to the direction of the President, be the duty of the Council to, one, assess and appraise the objectives, commitments, and risks of the United States Incorporated in relation to our actual and potential military power in the interests in the interests of national security for the purpose of making recommendations to the president in connection therewith and two to consider policies on matters of common interest to the departments and agencies of the government concerned with the national security and to make recommendations to the president in connection therewith I'll go over to um, Boston College Environmental Affairs Law Review, Formulating Population Policy, a Case Study of the United States. This was put out January 1st, 1974, by Rebecca J. Cook. The objectives of this article are, one, to describe how population policies are perceived, formulated, and implemented in the United States, and two, to analyze how and why the defini definition of demographic trends by 10 state commissions have a profound effect on how policies are developed and evaluated. Some of the demographic components of policy will be outlined for the lawmaker, and some of the legal components of policy will be described for the demogra demographer. For the purpose of explanation, four analytical population policy models are developed. One, the pa family planning model. Two, the motivation model. 
three, the population distribution model, and four, the per capita consumption model. There is no one correct policy model, but rather many policy models have and can be developed based on different social, economic, political, and environmental conditions of the state. The article's principal analytical utility lies in its challenge to state officials to develop their policy model based on the unique conditions and goals of their state. A legal system model outlines the many facets of policy making that should be taken into consideration in helping to determine which kinds of legal change should be used in implementing policy. Since the demographic effectiveness of legal change on a population policy is uncertain or unknown, subjecting alternative pieces of legislation, the, quote, inputs, to test hypothesizing a desired, quote, output might help to formulate and choose more effective policies. For example, compare the effectiveness of two pieces of legislation, one requiring the teaching of population education and the other instituting programs to raise the status of women. Determine which legal change would be functional in implementing a policy population reduction. This is referring to hearts and minds. The answer depends on how many conditions within a state, some of which could be determined by projecting the probable feedback. The effectiveness of any institution in implementing policies determine in part how well policies are defined and how well institutions are structured. It could be a relatively straightforward matter to establish effective statutory policy. Most states have developed adequate statutory family planning policies and have related the agencies, created the agencies necessary to implement the family planning objectives. However, they are just beginning to articulate and develop three subsequent models, the motivation model, the distribution model, and the per capita consumption model to enable them to adequately develop institutions capable of implementing these models' objectives. Once a policy is selected, the immediate institutional pro problem becomes a determination of the indicators needed to measure the policy's effectiveness. The search for criteria raise such issues as, one, is a two-family child, sorry, the search for criteria raise such issues as one is the two-child family an adequate policy indicator to measure the effectiveness of stabilization policy two do the given indicators ignore the other dimensions of the problem and three how are institutions best designed to evaluate policy this article asks more questions about policy making than is answered it is hoped however that the questions will be helpful in determining how and at what points the legal process can be used in formulating and implementing pol population policies. Section 1, Population Policy form Formulation. Population policy is a direct and indirect result of legislative, judicial, executive, and administrative actions affecting many demographic components. These components include, one, the size of population, two, the rate of increase or decrease of either birth, death, or growth rates, three, the distribution of a populace within an area, including both internal and international migration, four, the age and racial composition of a population, and five, the qualitative com composition of a population in terms of inter alia education, per capita consumption, and per capita income. Population policies follow along a wide spectrum. On one end, the anti-natalists assert the advantage of lower growth rates at the other, and the pro-natalists assert the benefits of an increased population. Between these extremes are variations with anticipated and unanticipated consequences. There are four behavioral elements of population change. Political, economic, social, and environmental. The effects of population change can be diagrammed by comparing these behavioral elements on a vertical axis and their determinants, meaning size, rate, distribution, and composition on a horizontal axis. A. State Population Commissions. 
In formulating population policy, states are faced with the choice of whether to allow existing trends to shape the future size, rates of growth, composition, distribution, and per capita consumption of its population, or whether to alter these trends by adopting population policies. Either alternative, in effect, constitutes population policy. Twelve states, through special state commissions, have issued reports recommending explicit policies either to stabilize growth rates or to locate the populace in better balance relative to resources and services. These policy recommendations agree with the following conclusions of the report of the Commission on Population Growth and the American Future, which was written in 1974, which states, quote, the Commission believes that the gradual stabilization of population bringing births into balance with deaths will contribute significantly to the nation's ability to solve its problems. Although such problems would be solved would not be solved by population stabilization alone. It would, however, enable our society to shift its focus increasingly from quantity to quality. These commissions have been either special population commissions, subcommittees, or state environmental commissions, or commissions on land use and population distribution. Although the commissions have been appointed by the governors and or the state legislators, the reports have been primarily the result of research by citizens and state officials interested in population matters. The commission members represent a broad spectrum of national, but sorry, the commission members represent a broad spectrum of racial, economic, religious, and academic backgrounds. The reports are based in large part upon citizen testimony, academic studies performed at state universities, and statements of state and local officials. As a result, these reports are useful in educating the general public about state population policies. B. Demographic Trends Recognizing that demographic trends form the basis of policy, the California, Colorado, Hawaii, Massachusetts and Michigan reports investigate the recent history and the projected future of population growth and change. Each report distinguishes between 1. Growth due to natural increase, 2. Growth due to migration, and 3. Differential growth rates between the urban and rural areas. Policies are recommended based on these three important distinctions. For example, Colorado's population grew by 26% in the 60s. However, 49% of this increase was due to net migration. California expanded by 28% in the 60s with a present population of about 20 million. 51% of that increase is in, attributable to net migration, but this factor has begun to diminish relatively and absolutely in relation to natural growth. California and Colorado were used as examples not only because they were among the fastest growing states in population, but because their population problems should be solved by two distinct policies. One aimed at net migration, immigration policies, and the other aimed at the birth rate. Now, if a human population birth rate is a problem for national security, they are talking about depopulation policy. This is not something that's hidden or in the background or away from you, or in a different, quote, country. A lot of you live in California. A lot of you live in Colorado. A lot of you live in Michigan. A lot of you live anywhere else. And this is in regards to population policy for national security, which is international. I urge everybody to read the National Security Council's Study Memorandum 200. Uh, April 24, 1974, this went out to the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Agriculture. You'll find that you, the human being, are considered an animal under 7 U.S.C., which is agriculture. The Director of Central Intelligence, that current director is Brennan. The Deputy Secretary of State, which is the Clearinghouse Administrator Agency for International Development. 
and the subject is Implication of Worldwide Population Growth for United States Incorporated Security and Overseas Interests. It starts out, the President has directed a study of the impact of world population growth on U United States Incorporated Security and Overseas Interests. The study should look, at, look forward at least until the year 2000 and use several alternative reasonable projections of population growth. In terms of each projection, the study should assess the corresponding pace of development, especially in poor countries, the demand for United States incorporated exports, especially of food, and the trade problems the United States incorporated may face rising from competition for resources and the likelihood that population growth or imbalance will produce disruptive foreign policies and international instability. The study should focus on the international political and economic implications of population growth rather than its ecological, sociological, or other aspects. The study should focus on the international political and economic impl implication of population growth rather than its ecological, sociological, or other aspects. The study would then offer possible courses of action for the United States Incorporated in dealing with population matters abroad, particularly in developing countries, with special attention to these questions. What, if any, new initiatives by the United States Incorporated are needed to focus international attention on the population problem? Can technological innovations or development reduce growth or ameliorate its effects? Could the United States Incorporated improve its assistance in the population field, and if so, in what form and through which agencies, bilateral, multilateral, or private? The study should take into account the President's concern that the population policy is a human concern intimately relative to the dignity of the individual and to the objective of the United States Incorporated is to work closely with others rather than seek to impose our views on others. They don't have to impose anything. They use the, the war tactic of winning hearts and minds. The President has directed that the study be accomplished by the National Security Council under Secretary's Committee. The Chairman under Secretary's Committee is requested to forward the study together with the Committee's action recommendations no later than May 29, 1974 for consideration by the President. This is what facilitated the Office of Population Affairs, otherwise known as the Department of Health and Human Services. At the date uh, on this writing, the President was Richard Nixon. From LikeTheDo.com, a, a short history of human husbandry. Once upon a time, when the continent was sparsely populated, the indigenous peoples having been largely killed off by introduction of pestilent disease, and natural resources seemed so abundant they would never be used up, public bodies called corporations were organized mainly to distribute the resources to the favored or privileged populace via an assortment of rights. Watcher rights, grazing rights, hunting rights, logging rights, mining rights, trading rights, building rights, fishing rights, etc. Parental rights, child rights. Some of these rights promote the practice of what we call animal husbandry. The advent of what we call human, civil, and consumer rights into the arena represented a significant change perhaps facilitated by the fact that the distribution of material assets from the public treasury was depleting those assets, some to the point of disappearance. Beaver, salmon, or trout came to mind. In any case, the refocus on people and the rights of the natural person constituted a significant revolution and apparently for some people provided a hint that like other natural resources, humans were available to be exploited. All that's necessary is to, is to persuade them to consent, and that can be accomplished quite simply by making the resources necessary to sustain their living increasingly scarce. That is, when there is no free lunch, humans can perform 
uh, sorry, uh, that is when there is no free lunch, humans can perforce be made to work, i.e. to subordinate themselves to those persons to whom other public assets and resources had been redistributed as private property. Thus was born human husbandry, examples of which we can see in the corrections industry, medical technology industry, home and national security industry, elder care, and higher education. The elementary education is also a target of exploitation to be expected. If natural resources aren't available to, can be, to be consumed, they're to be milked, and children are definitely a natural resource and fungible to boot. Materialism isn't necessary, necessarily about accumulating material resources and wealth. Materialism can also be evidenced by the exploitation of man by his fellow man, as if there were no difference between man and other organic and inorganic matter. Respect for life needn't enter into the consideration. Exploiting man in the name of religion, as Betsy, as Betsy DeVos and her association in the American Federation for Children proposed to do, is not new either. In the name of the nation and the dollar, and the rule of law is not very different from the traditional trinity if one's fellow man exists to be ruled, not served. Much depends on one's preconceived notions. For further reading, you can find that at likethedo.com. Now, going back to this predator that was nailed for child trafficking, child sex trafficking in Texas. He's actually an adherence to national security policy. They didn't charge him with espionage. They didn't charge his handlers with espionage. However, espionage is defined under 18 U.S.C. subsection 794, gathering or delivering defense information to aid a foreign government. A. Whoever with intent or reason to believe that it is to be used to the injury of the United States or to the advantage of a foreign nation communicates, delivers, or transmits, or attempts to communicate, deliver, or transmit to any foreign government or to any faction or party or military or naval force within a foreign country, whether recognized or unrecognized by the United States Incorporated or to any representative, officer, agent, employee, subject, or citizen thereof either directly or indirectly, any documentation, writing, code book, signal book, sketch, photograph, photographic negative, blueprint, plan, model, no instrument, appliance, or information relating to national defense shall be punished by death or by imprisonment for any term of years or for life except for that the sentence of death not been, shall not be imposed unless the injury or if there is no injury the court for the fines of the offense resulted in the identification of foreign power as defined in Section 10A of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 78 of an, individu an individual acting as an agent of the United States and consequently in the death of that individual or directly concerned nuclear weaponry, military spacecraft or satellites, early warning system, or other means of defense or retaliation against large scale attack, war plans, communications intelligence, or cryptographic information or any other major weapon system or major element of, of defense strategy. Yes, it's a mouthful. However, this is a defense strategy when they're preying on your kids, raping and molesting your children in adherence to national security to make the child more productive later, enter them into the court process, trick them out by attorney in a black dress, prosecuting attorneys, and using their body to the utmost is the action of national security. For further information on national security, I urge everybody to go to avalon.law.yale.edu forward slash 17th century Westfall.asp, the Treaty of Westphalia, peace treaty between the Holy Roman Empire and the King of France and their respective allies, 1648. The very last line, the very last sentence. In the name of the one and the other, Bench M. Mark Ota of Strasbourg. M. John James Wolfe of Radisborg, M. David Gloxinos of Lubeck, and M. Louis Christopher Cress of Crescentine, all syndic, senators, counselors, and advocates of the Republic of Nuremberg, who with their proper heads of seals have signed and sealed this present treaty of peace, 
and with said deputies of the several orders have engaged to procure the ratifications of their superiors in the prefixed times and in the manner it has been convened leaving the liberty to the other plenipotentiaries <laughs> of states to sign it if they think it convenient and send for ratifications of their superiors and that on no condition on, and that on condition that by the subscription of the aforesaid ambassadors and deputies all and every one of the other states who shall abstain from signing and ratifying the present treaty shall be no less obliged to maintain and observe what is contained in this present treaty or pacification than if they had subscribed and rat ratified it and no protestation or contradiction of the council of direction in the Roman Empire shall be valid or received in respect to the subscription and said deputies have made. Done, passed, and concluded at Munster and Muswalia, the 24th day of October, 1648. From NBCDunes.com, Casey Kasem's wife releases disturbing audio of Icon. Ah, uh, this is deplorable. Okay, I've been a wife. I am, for all intents and purposes, always a wife. My husband marries me, trusting me. Now, there is a court interceding in Casey Kasem's marital relationship as to his care and comfort during his end stages of life. This court is child trafficking. This court is human trafficking, an adult in need. If you continue to subscribe, if you continue to patronize this thing, this is your end of life. You will be institutionalized, mocked, embarrassed, put through the media, run through the ringer, and everything else that comes along with national security. Now this is one of our beloved, uh, you know, TV and radio icons. I mean, he's, he was a voice of uh, Shaggy in Scooby-Doo. And now that he needs his wife the most, the court has come in at the behest of his psychopathic children to remove her from the ability to protect him for their interests. They are concerned about the money. The court is concerned about his money. The attorneys are getting out his money, using him while he needs human protection the most to facilitate national security and agenda. Enough is enough. I've got Bo with me, everybody. Hi, Bo, how are you? Hello, good. How are you? Tired. That was a mouthful. Yeah, boy, it sure is. And people need to hear this. They need to read it for themselves. They need to realize the nature of this mechanism that is one perpetual congressional action started way back before any of us were born. Okay? I mean, we can debate all day long, you know, whether uh, it started at the Treaty of Westphalia or the Charters of the 1600s or... You know, uh, 1066, 1180, uh, you know, the, the 12 tables, uh, 450 B.C., but, you know, it's all the same thing. I, like I was pointing out the other day, like, if you read you know, the 12 tables and read, uh, you know, how the numerology of the articles correspond to everything we see today, United States Code... You know, for example, Title IV relates to parents but try. The flag. Uh, you know, and Maybe so does USC. Right. Right. Uh, it has to do with uh, the daddy state, right? Uniform commercial code. <laughs> then it, it goes into accounting. Um, the form. Yeah, the UCC is a little bit difficult. A little bit more difficult to see, but it's still parents but try once you dig into it. Right, because under the banking schematic. Uh, when you go into court, for example, and you patronize that uh, judge under Title IV, which it becomes the father, then you are that account, you are being deposited into that bank. 
that's the banking schematic itself and then you have CFR uh, 4 and related it's all in relation to how to manipulate the human being to make it most efficient and the, the treaties and uh, b b bill, bill of rights or uh, fourth amendment uh, yeah uh, right to uh, you know um, patronize who you want to what's that title or oh, that has to do with um, search and seizure right so how can you be taken how can you be brought into law to be that deposit? Like, here's your right we're given to you not to be, you know, searched and seized. But under that Commerce Clause, we can act under Private Acts next. Commerce, do whatever we want to if you're patronized. Us. Thanks for your consent. Well, it's more uh, egregious than that. So the right uh, search and seizure. So this, they're telling you they can seize you one way. They just can't seize you that way without you, you know, pitching a fit. Okay, but you're still consenting to search and seizure if you're adhering to that right. You know, it's like you always say with Rod Class, you know, you're administering me wrongly. Okay, if you argue that you're being administered wrongly, you're still consenting to be administered in the first place. It doesn't matter what they're doing to you, this is how they cash in. That's part of the uh, program and schematic under the capacity building venture, Pyongyang. Right. What I try to tell people over and over again is that they first had to take these rights away from you in order to sell them back to you. Right. You know, and then they got them constitutions. Well, we got to get back to our organic constitution. And okay, well, let's see. Under that organic constitution, there's still that commerce clause, isn't there? Well, the Constitution is a constitution all day long. A citizen is a citizen is a plebeian all day long. That's all it is. You got doctrine election. You have either uh, you can choose to be one or the other, not both. Right. Okay. So I chose to be a sovereign state, so I can come in under the restrictive principle of sovereign immunity and hold them accountable for harms against humanity. And was, this was evidence to the case, and found them guilty of human trafficking and genocide. Okay. Human trafficking, genocide. Right. Okay. That's in one hand. On the other hand, you got all the people out there uh, stopping their feet for constitutional rights, and you know they they want to get the traffic ticket kicked and uh, get administered better. Uh, ridiculous. I mean, all roads not under the public law lead to Rome. Absolutely. The public law just says to do no harm. Now, under the restrictive principle of sovereign immunity, if you come in as a sovereign state as seen in their own definition in um, eight, uh, 28 U.S.C. Uh, 1603 is the definition, that's chapter 97. I advise reading the entire chapter 97 on the Sovereign Immunities Act. Okay, now, and it says if you harm a human being, it doesn't matter who you are, what your title is, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, uh, you know, uh, Joe Blow citizen or Barack Obama, the restrictive principle of sovereign immunity, right. the playing field is level. And so why do you want to patronize the thing that's oppressing you and, and, and carrying out these acts of human trafficking and genocide? And not only that, go back to relativity. Okay, is it, is it lawful to harm any being? Is it lawful? Uh, bottom line. The attorneys have defined, you know, where it's legal to kill babies, neonaticide, infanticide, abortion. They are determining when life begins and why, when life can end, quote, legally. And now we're in the realm where they've got assisted suicide so far advanced in the Netherlands that the elderly oh, yeah. are feeling like they're just useless bread gobblers because of the presentation through the media theory, through the psychological induction, and all of these things that allow such mindsets to occur. Yeah, in Ohio now, talk about uh, terrorism. Uh, in Ohio, they now have a uh, capital punishment uh, machine that rips the head off. 
It's not even a guillotine. It's just a machine uh, that rips the head off. Can you believe that? Well, thankfully. I mean, the attorneys, once they went into the shoot last year, that leaves them up for grabs. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, they define abortion. They are a non-sentient being. Attorneys rely on a body, body politic for their survival. And under their definition, if something is a leech on another body, it's able to be aborted. I don't mind ripping their head off. I don't mind that at all. Yeah, well, okay, as long as uh, no... Uh, human beings. Human beings. Uh, I mean, a human being shouldn't find that... Uh, find themselves in that position anyways if they're adhering to public law and not harming people. Right. Now, you know, when you cross the line is when, you know, you harm a human being. Right. And that, that's, that's within psychopathy. And it's all defined in the genocide order itself because psychopathy is not humanity. Psychopathy adheres to national security. Now, you had covered a story on the child burned by a distraction device during a raid um, the sheriff is making a statement now that he stands behind all of that. So sure, he does. We found another psychopath. Yeah, um, yeah, and he and he uh, is calling himself a sheriff, you know, which uh, he's uh, obviously evidencing himself to be one of the sheriffs uh, by title for the corporation because the original sheriffs were a steward for, uh, of humanity. Right. They didn't need a, a ruling from a judge to go. Uh, you know, take care of business when they uh, witness something or evidence something, such as, uh, you know... Human trafficking or genocide. Anything, anything. It's a violation of, uh, you know, uh, the public law harming human beings. And, uh, you know, now we have all these uh, people called sheriffs, but they're Offices. not stewards. They're far from stewards of humanity. No, it's a fiction when it's an office they're, or a title. They're holding those surety bonds... And selling them to the attorneys. Those surety bonds are you, okay? And they sell them to the attorneys in uh, an act of uh, human trafficking. So the quote-unquote sheriffs are involved in this. Yeah, and, and, now, and now this guy, you know, it should be pointed out too that this uh, unit that uh, was the one responsible for uh, the... Uh, baby getting burned in the crib uh, has a uh, has has more of a history behind it here I'll have to pull up that story but uh, they also were responsible for uh, something in 2009 similar I'll get that up here in a moment uh, but uh, this one here you know of course this is uh, Habersham County uh, in uh, Atlanta, right? Was this Atlanta? Yeah. Sure. Georgia. So, Sheriff Joey Terrell is now talking about the high-risk warrant service that resulted in burns to two-year-old child early Wednesday. Okay, the child was burned when narcotics agents assisted by members of the Habersham Special Response Team used a distraction device as they entered a home at 182 Lakeview Heights Circle Lights outside Cornelia. We had prior information on it, Terrell said, of the circumstances of the home and its occupants. The individual had been involved in um, an altercation with another male involving a possible AK-47 rifle several months ago. And he was arrested on some weapons charges. Supposedly that was about drugs. Okay. Okay, wait. Let, let's note here that nobody's harming anybody. They just happen to have a weapon, or they happen to have drugs. Nobody's been harmed. There's just a concept created in the mind here through the use of media that there is a potential threat there. Yeah, and of course the federal government, they don't uh, use firearms to protect drugs in Afghanistan or anything. Absolutely not. No. no. <laughs> of course I'm being facetious there. Okay, uh... Terrell said agents followed standard procedure prior to obtaining a search warrant and planning the raid. Well, remember, procedure is nothing but a list of instructions written up by attorneys. Okay, that's what it is. Policy, procedure, uh, all these uh, things that uh, uh, operate uh, alongside of quote-unquote the law. 
uh, you know, are handed down by the attorneys. And cops, of course, they want to keep their jobs. You know, they think they're doing the right thing. So I guess, you know, got to go in and throw grenades in babies' faces. You know, that's just what the uh, federal state demands of me, and I want my paycheck. Terrell said that uh, the drug buy was made late Tuesday. Let's see, backing up uh, a little bit here, says, When we did surveillance on the house, there were two guards standing guard at the door, like they were, weren't letting anybody in, Terrell said. We did make the buy out of the house. Okay. Uh, make make, make remember, the buy out of the house. And, and remember, nobody's oh, been harmed. Oh, they made the buy. That's right. They set him up in a sting operation. Right. Well, remember, nobody's been harmed. A child is not harmed. Nope. Nobody's being harmed yet. Nope. Nobody's been harmed yet. No evidence of that that I can see. We only uh, rule by the evidence in the United States court lower case from the public law. Uh, we took that information along with our other information and we sent it to the judge, quote unquote judge, because this is a attorney in a black dress. There are no judges since the 1789 Judiciary Act, folks. That's right. 1789 Judiciary Act set up the courts to be places of business. Okay? This is the schematic is nothing new, and it goes back before the quote unquote United States of America. Like I said, go back uh, 450 BC, even uh, 12 tables. But um, let's see here. Our team captain asked the normal questions. Is there children? Terrell said. If there's children involved in a house, we do not use any kind of distraction devices in those houses. We just don't take the chance on. Yeah, it. we we saw that. We saw the evidence of this recently. But there were no indications of children in the hall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, all right. Um, you know, in the acts of uh, the national state over the uh, uh, state, okay, um, you know, what, what do you need to know this for? This is espionage, of course, not against uh, citizens. That's the problem here. Too many citizens, and they're still patronizing the thing that's killing them. Okay, side issue there. Uh, let's see, but there were no indications of the children. But according to the confidential information, there were no children. When they made the buy, they didn't see any children or any evidence of children there. So we proceeded with our standard mm -hmm. operation. Right. Okay, how many standard operations were carried out in uh, these foreign countries in these uh, recent wars and how many innocent citizens die all the time due to these perpetual wars? You know, ever since I've been alive, uh, this country has been under a state of emergency and we've been at war somewhere or another. Always that perpetual state of emergency you renew every two years. It's like, uh, you know, I, you know, federal government operates under that Emergency 51 so theme song. Dun, 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 dun. Emergency. Warning. Danger, Will Robinson. Right. Oh, so since Clear Moses. and present danger doctrine. They used it in psychological warfare over and over again. Since Moses. That's right. Since Moses. Because of recent history with the individual involved in alleged drug sales and knowledge of weapons in the residence, the special agent seeking the search warrant requested a no-knock warrant. Mountain Judicial Circuit uh, Narcotics Criminal Investigation and Suppression Team agents obtained a search warrant for the residence with no-knock entry provision approved by Habersham County Chief Magistrate Judge and Jim, uh, Judge Jim Butterworth. Oh, boy. Okay, now, let's get to the definition of this child now. This child was harmed by this uh, device, it's, and um, they've listed the child as injured. Injured, yeah. Oh, yep, we brought him in the law, says the attorney. Oh, good job there, Mr. Cop. Yeah, the judge wanted injury. The judge, the banker, was reliant on injury under the National Security Act and policy. It's almost a given when they come in there uh, armed to the teeth and dispatch saying, uh, you know, intelligence uh, shows they may be armed and dangerous and, you know, weapons. There was, no intent, there was no evidence of any danger or any harm upon a human being until that child 
was injured upon the directions of that judge, that banker. Due to the previous information regarding assault type weapons. Oh, there we go to break. We'll be back, folks. Stick around. Hi, and welcome back to the second hour of Leaving the Farm right here on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. We are a listener-supported radio station. One, if you'd like to donate, please visit us at www.freedomslips.com and click on our support pages. Every little bit helps. We're also simulcasting tonight on No Borders Radio at nobordersradio.co.uk as well as Tir Nassour. In Scotland, Ireland, sorry, and that can be located at TerranStore.com. Before the break, we were covering national security, uh, of course, related fallout and everything else that this so called government, which is defined under its own laws, 28 U.S.C. subsection 1603, as a corporation. Yeah, anytime you use the word national, uh, you know, it could mean a nation could be a corporation. Right, it is. A foreign nation is defined as a corporation. Yeah, there you go. Um, and that's where the restrictive principle of sovereign immunity comes in. Because if it's a corporation and it's adhering to its corporate interests, of course it's not with immunity and not with so sovereignty because it's a corporation as defined under 28 U.C. subsection 1603. Well, let's see, I, I didn't get to finish that story before the break, uh, but um, I, I guess um, long story short is that, uh, you know, these no-knock warrants are just, there's your uh, Fourth Amendment right, folks. How's that working out for you? How's that working out for that toddler? Huh? I mean, I mean, I mean, come on. The, the, the only one that harmed anybody in this was uh, these cops. At the directives of the judge. Yeah. The prosecuting attorney. And the attorneys in the black dresses and all the other attorneys that are cashing in on injury of a child. And per perpetuating, uh, you know, uh, the enforcement of commercial crimes under 27 Code of Federal Regulations, 72.11. That's Code of Regulations. See? That's not even really listed as law. That's just, that's just their policy. Policy, remember, comes from the word poly, meaning many. CY stemming from the word side to you know means to kill so you know policy means to kill many how do you like that policy we folks have to go back to the inception of policy and these are insurance policies and each time the corporation comes in with another article of incorporation or article of agreement which is what the articles are in the articles of confederation the articles of the constitution articles of all of these treaties to articles of charters bank agreements these are just growing the corporation and making it more efficient as a corporation. It's adding in, like, um, they'll see a failure of one of the mechanisms or one of the parts of the machine. They'll replace that part with another part. That's all it is. It just grows and grows and becomes a more efficient corporation, according to corporate policy, which are life insurance policies. And you can read that right in the 14th Amendment. That is a life insurance policy, insuring the lives of corporations, otherwise known as persons, that seceded your estates. The human beings' estates were all seceded upon the secession throughout the span of time when the corporation was being formulated back in the 1600s. And prior to that, I mean, it was Rome before that, but it just becomes more and more and more efficient as time goes on, and with the consent of the governed. So, do the previous information, picking back up on this, regarding assault-type weapons at the residence, the information regarding adult male subjects standing guard in front of the residence, the fact that there was no safe way to approach the residence without being detected, the possibility of destruction of evidence. See, evidence is more important than human lives here. Uh, and Juanis uh, Thon Theva's criminal history, which reflected charges of possession of firearms during commission of a felony and several charges of carrying concealed weapons. Agent contacted the Habersham County Sheriff's Office Special Response Team unit to assist with the execution of the search warrant and securing of the residence. Um, the three-bedroom, two-bath house is single-story. 
with enclosed garage. We check the door. If it's unlocked, we enter. The door was locked, so they breached the door. There was an obstruction at the door. They tossed a flashbang. Our team leader has been through the school on the use of flashbangs. The distraction devices is the only way we can even purchase them. We have to have a license. Right, he, from the same attorneys. Yeah. And how did that work out? It harmed a baby. Now, as I was saying earlier, this uh, drug task force also has a history. Um, they killed an innocent pastor in 2009. Um, well, that's what the story reads anyways. Yeah, um, like uh, priests and scribes, you know, I'm not really, I'm kind of suspicious of all of them. But, uh, yeah, this is, uh, let's see, after Georgia's Mountain Judicial Circuit Narcotics Criminal Investigation, the suppression team burned a toddler with a flash bang grenade during a raid on Wednesday, Haversham County Sheriff Office, Office uh, uh, County Sheriff Joey Terrell told Access North Georgia, the person I blame in this whole thing is the person selling the drugs. Yeah, not, not, not the one that, uh, you know. It actually harmed. Yeah, not the, the one that harms people. The person that was selling the drugs never harmed that child. There was no evidence of any harm upon that child until corporate policy enforcers directed by the judges, the attorneys, prosecuting attorneys, harm that child. Well, Period. That, that baby happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, there's no doubt. However, it's policy handed down by attorneys that caused this harm upon an 18-month-old toddler. A baby. And it's the same type of thing with the corporate handlers telling these grunts in Afghanistan, Iraq, or wherever to carry out the things that they do there. And many, many, many innocent people are harmed. Does it bother the attorneys? No, they no. cash in on it. They cash in on any kind of injury. Any kind of injury re results in a diagnosis and, and facilitates the action of bottom rebounds. But this uh, same task force has a history um, in the death of Jonathan Ayers, an innocent pastor that this same drug task force killed in a drug operation in 2009, the p young pastor was ministering to a young woman whom a Georgia drug task officer was investigating on drug charges. She had allegedly sold an undercover officer $50 worth of cocaine. When task force members saw Ayers alone in the car with the woman, they switched their focus to him. According to Ayers' lawsuit, the woman was about to be evicted from the motel at which she was staying. Ayers gave her the $23 in his pocket to help cover her rent. The task force followed Ayers to a convenience store where he went to get money from the ATM. When he returned and got in his car, they pounced. They pulled him behind. They pulled up behind him and in an unmarked black SUV. Thank you, Jack Bauer. Uh, armed agents dressed in street clothes then rushed Ayers' car. He put his car in reverse and attempted to escape in the process. He nicked one agent, another then opened fire, killing him. Ayers told hospital staff that he thought he was being robbed. His reported last words were, who shot me? Aww. Okay, so, I mean, how is this any different from... Uh, what they throw up in your face as terrorists on the mainstream media. It's not. It's the same thing, people. Okay? And this comes from the federal government, okay? Which, under the definition of confederacy, at the end it says, see federal government. Okay? Confederacy is a criminal enterprise. Okay? And you're still patronizing it. You're still wanting to have those... Nice, shiny things that the government has to offer. It looks so good. And what you get is death. They're dishing out death on a global scale. And you patronizing it are, are feeding the beast. Okay, so on the other side of the coin here, Tammy, we got a story. Um, in breaking news at uh, BakerfieldCalifornia.com. Californian.com, attorney, others arrested in drug bust. Kern County Sheriff's deputies arrested defense attorney 
and two others as part of a narcotics investigation. On Thursday, authorities went to the 2500 block of Diamond Street and found Kimberly Stowers, 32, of Rosamond and Jesus Carlo, Carlo, uh, Carlo, 58, of Rosamond, working inside a vacant duplex, according to the deputies. Carrillo is on parole, authorities said. Yeah, I wonder what that's for, uh, some kind of commercial crime again, I'm sure. Uh... Well, they consider them all commercial crimes. That's the whole thing right. about these attorneys. They lump only, everything into the same category. Right, but only fictions can be charged with commercial crimes. And an attorney is a fiction. It's it's an office. It's a title. It's color. So the search of the duplex uncovered a small amount of methamphetamine. And Carillo was arrested on suspicion of possession of methamphetamine. And Stores was arrested on suspicion of being under the influence of Possession of methamphetamine. Another suspect, Craig Elkin, 62, a local defense attorney, was contracted just outside the duplex, deputies said. Elkin was displaying signs of drug influence and was subsequently arrested for being under the influence of controlled substance, deputies said. Uh, authorities returned with a search warrant for the joining uh, complex. Uh, before midnight on Thursday, assisted by members of the California Multi-Jurisdictional Methamphetamine Enforcement Team, or cal Met, They seized about 5 grams of methamphetamine, a small amount of marijuana, various packaging scales, and drug paraphernalia, including numerous methamphetamine smoking pipes. One of the rooms in the residence contained more than $400 in cash and a pay and O sheet. Okay. Uh, authorities have... Asked for additional charge of possession of methamphetamine, possession of paraphernalia, and delaying of a peace officer for Elkin. The Stowers deputies have asked for additional charges of possession of controlled substance for sale. So get on in there, little attorney. You know, another attorney, district attorney candidate in California, arrested twice in 24 hours for alcohol related offenses. Twice in 24 hours. Aww. It's a bad day for them attorneys out there. Memorial Day weekend arrests are just Gary Hickey's latest. Above our mugshots from three uh, of the troubled candidates' recent arrests. Boy. You know, all these mugshots of this attorney. Uh, let's see. Uh. Candidate for a district attorney in small California town is making a name for himself for all the wrong reasons. Gary Hickey, a lawyer in Lodi, California, and a candidate for San Joaquin County district attorney, was arrested twice in a 24-hour period over Memorial Day weekend, both times for alcohol-related offenses. Uh, Hickey, 64, was first collared Friday in uh, Lodi for public drunkenness after cops received calls that a defense lawyer reportedly more than a little tipsy was driving around town in a U-Haul truck. U-Haul truck. That's police, interesting. <laughs> police handcuffed Hickey with drink in hand. Oh my goodness. Oh. But after a few hours in the cell where he apparently sobered up, he was released. Okay. I wonder who purchased him. Just a few hours later, however, on Saturday evening, police again arrested Hickey for allegedly assaulting a woman at his home. Oh, my goodness. Hickey he should be in there. He, he harmed a human. <laughs> yeah. They, well, they let him out. They released him so he'd go cause some more injury and go stir up some more business, I guess, right? Huh? For the court industrial complex under that 1789 Judiciary Act and all the rest of it. Started to cease since 1938, which is communism. Uh, emergency banking act. Mm hmm Police have said they believe the victim of the assault was Hickey's housekeeper. The arrests are just the latest in a long list of drunken offenses. Last month, Hickey was nailed for driving under the influence of alcohol, and last August, he re reportedly crashed his car into a telephone pole, again while drunk, and fled the scene. Man, they just keep letting this guy, they just keep releasing him out. And good for business. They're waiting for him to kill somebody. Yeah, that's what they're waiting for. Fellow lawyers, 
have told local media outlets that Hickey has shown up to court drunk when he shows up at all, but the troubled candidate has shown no signs that he'll uh, exit the race, uh, despite most polling showing uh, he, he'll inevitably lose to favorite uh, Tory Verber Salazar. Yeah, I'm sure he's a much better attorney. Uh, he's probably the uh, one that called in the, the um, hotline. Probably. Drunk. Right, right. They can't, they're cannibalizing each other. I hope he gets the help he needs. Salazar told yeah. the TV station. Yeah, oh, he's yeah. Concerned. He's a concerned attorney. He's concerned about the other attorney <laughs> running against him. <laughs> yes, he is. And um, see, there's just, just, just more evidence that, you know, these attorneys are just sleazy, disgusting creatures. And, and they're running for offices, and you people go and vote for this nonsense. It's insane on its face, people. Do you know how insane in voting voting is? It's as crazy as a soup sandwich. Well, this one's from the FBI.gov um, Pittsburgh. It's on their press release site. Uh, it came out to yesterday. U.S. Attorney files charges in multi-million dollar kickback scheme orchestrated at Logan County Mine. Charleston, West Virginia, United States Attorney Booth Goodwin today filed a variety of charges in United States District Court in Charleston arising out of a joint federal and state criminal investigation into cash kickbacks paid to Arch Cole of or Arch employees working at the Mount Laurel Mining Complex or Mount Laurel near Sharples, Logan County, West Virginia. The charges lay out a far-reaching scheme orchestrated by Arch employees including the former Mount Laurel General Manager David E. Runyon 45 of Del Barton, Mingo County, to receive cash kickbacks from certain vendors in exchange for receiving work. According to the charges, vendors were required to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars over several years to ensure that vendors received and continue to receive work at Mount Laurel. Now, this case stems from, I mean, they had a shakedown in Mingo County since October. They have nailed, I don't know how many judges and attorneys out of that county, um, uh, revamping everything because that's where the kickback steam, uh, schematic was stemming from. Quote, this kind of pay-to-play scheme hurts honest coal industry vendors who refuse to pay bribes as a way to get customers, end quote, commented U.S. Attorney Booth Goodwin. Quote, the corrupt way that these defendants did business should be a thing of the past. It's bad for the economy and ultimately bad for consumers. According to the charges, David E. Ryan, 45, of Del Barton, Mingo County, is charged with extorting certain vendors for cash kickbacks in exchange for ensuring that those complicit vendors continue to receive work from Mount Laurel. As outlined below, Ryan and other Arch employees are charged with receiving kickbacks approaching $2 million FRNs over a five-year span from sometime in 2007 through sometime in 2012. Runyon faces up to 25 years imprisonment and a fine up to $500,000 if convicted. Gary K. Griffith, 62, of Oceana, Wyoming County, was charged with making a materially false statement to federal and state law enforcement which, when interviewed in the Mount Laurel kickback scheme investigation. According to the charge, he was a maintenance manager at Mount Laurel and received cash kickbacks in the amount of at least $250,000 on behalf of him and mine general manager David E. Ryan from a vendor who refurbished shuttle cars. When he was asked by federal agents about receiving kickbacks either personally or on behalf of Ryan, he denied it. Griffin faces up to five years imprisonment and a fine up to $250,000 if convicted. Stephen B. Herndon, 37, of Holdren, Holden, Logan County, the former Mount Laurel warehouse manager, now owner of Tri-State Mine Service Incorporated, is charged with structuring a cash withdrawal from a local bank. The term structuring is used to describe criminal conduct when an individual engages in cash transactions with a financial institution in increments of $10,000 or less for the purpose of avoiding the financial institution's currency transaction report, or CTR, filing requirements with the Department of Treasury. Herndon faces up to five years imprisonment and a fine up to $250,000 if convicted. Scott E. Ellis, 44, of Holden, Logan County. Stephen B. Herndon is Herndon's business partner in Tri-State. is also charged with structuring a cash withdrawal with, from a local bank account. 
According to the information filed in Rodney Kay's Tri-State through Allison Herndon paid nearly $425,000 at Varenz over a five-year period to receive rebuild work for Mount Laurel. Alice faces up to five years imprisonment and a fine up to $250,000 if convicted. Alvis R. Porter, 61, of Holden, Logan County, owner and operator of Quality Oil Incorporated, was doing business as Southern Construction of Logan, provided construction services for the Mount Laurel Mine and Complex. Porter was charged with fail failing to collect, account for, and pay over trust fund taxes of an employee. As part of Runyon's charge, Porter said approximately $400,000 FRNs and kickbacks directed to Runyon. Porter faces up to five years imprisonment and a fine of up to $250,000 if convicted. David N. Herndon, 63, of Chauncey, Logan County, was charged with engaging in an unlawful monetary trans transaction of criminality, criminally derived property of a value greater than $10,000. According to the charge, David Herndon owned MAC Mine Services Incorporated, which provided contract labor to the Mount Laurel Mining Complex. The Herndon participated in a contract labor kickback scheme, where in exchange for Rania not seeking to terminate the contract and instead extending the contract each year, David Herndon paid illegal cash kickbacks of approximately $340,000 for more than three years. The Herndon faces up to 10 years imprisonment and a fine up to $250,000 if convicted. Another $250,000 amount out right. there, which is good to see. Right. Uh, if you followed the show, you know what we're talking well, about. Well, I'm not going to go into reading in depth, but there's also Ronald Burnett, 53, uh, Gary a. L. Rower, 52, Chadwick J. Lusick, 32, James H. Evans, the second, 39, and all of them have $250,000 uh, fines that they're facing. Now, the isn't that interesting? Yes, it's beautiful to see, as well as the uh, corporate structure, the public utilities aspect as well. And we'll get more into that as we get closer to the reset in July. We'll explain that more into depth. Big reset coming, folks. Hang in there. Just abstain from contracting with the federal state for the time being any further if you can. Um, it's going to go a long ways as we shift over to the public law. And it is going to happen. It is happening. Okay. What happens to us at this point is really irrelevant because uh, there are enough people out there that have been following what we're doing that they can pick up the ball and uh, carried on to the uh, finish line for humanity. And that's what the, the, the game is all about. It's going to be humanity that wins out in the end or the attorneys. All right? I uh, place the bet on humanity. Cause, Absolutely. Because I'm hoping there's enough left out there it's already bonded. to save up uh, to, uh, you know, to it'll stand up. Now, let's see, uh, over at Herald Sun, Law and Order section, third man charged over alleged $100 million fraud involving bank loans. Now, remember these things you call banks? That's the one in Australia. The Australian Federation there. Right, right. And they're, you know, they're sucked in the Congress under the 1941 Atlantic Charter. They're so-called government there is uh, all about um, you know sticking its citizens in as a special deposit to offset congressional bankruptcy right okay uh, let's see here so a third man charged over an alleged hundred million dollar scam involving fraudulent bank loans of Melbourne accounting firm and poker player faces uh, has faced Melbourne magistrates court okay now remember, a bank, what you call a bank, its board of directors are all attorneys. So in reality, the fronts of, you know, I mean, these these things are, are law firms. Okay? The buildings are run by law firms. They're called banks. The banking is actually facilitated through the court. Under 28 U.S.C. 453, the judge's oath, he is discharging his duties. You have to look up those words in Black's Law and see what we're talking about here. But he's 
you know, throwing you in as a special deposit to offset congressional bankruptcy. That's what you get for being a citizen. Those directors, attorney oaths, are located under 12 U.S.C. subsection 73. Yeah. Yeah, and um, it, it says it all under the Banking Act. Yeah, right. You know, I mean... Title, title 12, oh boy, that's just, uh, I mean, if that doesn't tell you the, the tyrannical nature of which you've been enslaved under Title 12 and this attorney money nonsense, my goodness, anyways. Sorry about the tripping, folks, I've got a battery going dead on a fire uh, alarm thing. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah, it's chirping, I can't reach it. Usually I just beat them to death with broomsticks. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Got to be careful with them, though. They have a radioactive element in them there. Yeah. Isn't that nice of them to put yeah. that in our homes? Uh, oh, man. Account, accountant Robert Zaya, 49, was granted bail after being charged with more than 100 offenses over an alleged decade-long scam involving dodgy loan applications with the Commonwealth Bank Lodge by Scoresby-based accounting firm Zaya, Arthur, and Associates. The court heard uh, the Listerfield man faces the same charges. A 55-year-old champion poker player, William Giordano, Giordano, who was bailed out yesterday. Mr. Giordano was charged with 142 offenses relating to fraud, including obtaining property by deception, obtaining financial advantage by deception, attempting to obtain financial advantage by deception and theft, and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Oh, no, no, no. Under, read Title 12. He's following the uh, quote-unquote justice system. Yeah. It is alleged that Mr. Giordano, Mr. Zaya, and Frank Porcino told one man not to talk to police to tell them that they were his accountants and did nothing wrong, that they would look after him, and that Mr. Porcino knew exactly what was going on. It's believed two more people will be interviewed and charged over the complex scheme in the coming days. Goody, 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 goody. Uh, Mr. Porcino had already been charged over related matters, the court heard. Uh, Prosecutor Luke Exel told... The court on Wednesday, the charges stem from a complaint was made by the Commonwealth Bank of Australia regarding property development loan applications lodged by the accounting firm allegedly supported by false documents. He said the false documents included tax documents, financial and bank statements, and letters of employment. Mr. Excel said the accused used false builders, invoices, and clients' approval to withdraw the funds which was then spent on property developments and to fund a certain lifestyle. Right. You know, because these Roman senators, you know, they got to have their daily baths and, uh, you know, their wine goblets filled up by their servants, right? The court heard it was originally believed the alleged crimes involved around $9 million of fraudulently obtained funds, but investigations into transactions between 2004 and 2013 resulted in the discovery of around $100 million of ill-gotten gains. $100 million, folks. Well, people are getting their uh, water shut off in Detroit, hundreds of thousands of them now, because they didn't pay their water bill. They couldn't. George uh, Defteros, re representing both Mr. Giordano and Mr. Zaya, told the court on Wednesday he welcomed the charges, which they had been... Uh, prepared for since the firm's premise was raided. The premises were uh, raided uh, in 2012 and would vigorously deny them. The court heard civil proceedings involving the Commonwealth Bank were on the foot in the Supreme Court relating to some of the allegations. The Supreme Court of Australia, okay? Absolutely. It's, see, you know, it's right in your face. There's, there's no difference... Globally, every country has their own Supreme Court, right. just like the United States of America. Same constitution, it only changes according to market conditions since the uh, Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta is the foundation of every constitution, 
And what it's called is seen die. Which means without a day or without a death. It just changes according to market conditions. So Mr. Zayas... Bail conditions included weekly reporting to police, remaining in Australia, and having no contact with the 150 prosecution witnesses, excluding his ex-wife and sister, or their families. He will return to court for committal mention on September 17th. Fine. So in the meantime, he's out there running amok until September 17th, isn't he? Right. Doing God knows what. Yeah. Taking off with an outstanding... Um, that, that that's something that probably needs to be tapped on is the Magna Carta uh, means big charter in Italian. You know, everybody knows about the Roman Empire. Rome is part of Italy. It's always just moved according to who the winner is. Roman law is winner take all. And at this current time, the United States incorporated its top dog. They've been top dog. Um, these lesser knowns, Japan, Korea, uh, Australia, China, Greece, uh, Italy, they're all under the same corporate policy because as time went along, the United States Incorporated rose to the top. And um, the treaties are still with Rome, still with France, still with the same empire. It's just the leaders are in this uh, the quote American administration. Biden is top Roman senator, for example. President yeah, and he's a better actor than um, oh, what was that recent movie I saw, Pompeii, where Kiefer Sutherland plays a Roman senator. Horrible, horrible actor. Is anything other than Jack Bauer? I mean, uh, Biden uh, is evidenced. Uh, you know, with his acting, is a much better actor than Keeper Sutherland. Attorneys are, are very, very efficient actors. They've always been. That's part of their training um, to maintain speech or maintain that great red rod, the, the perpetual great red rod that came out of, quote, Lycurgus's mouth, which, of course, it was a fictional entity. It's also known as uh, Plutarch. Plato and, and other ideologies that were maintained originally to uh, pervert the mind. And um, it's part of everybody's educational experience, uh, otherwise known as pedagogy, which stems from, the etymology stems from attendance on boys. And that, that's all it's about. The Roman Senate needs all of the alpha males to be laid back down so that they, the humanity as a whole can be manipulated by attorney and legal process under this huge corporate structure. Yeah, and we've been so conditioned by it, you know, people are, you know, getting uh, attacked uh, in black SUVs, you don't know what agency or if they're terrorists, and there's people that think, oh, that's just normal now. Yeah, urban classification. I love this freedom we have. Give me some more constitutional rights. Uh, yeah, okay, so the IMF board approves $4.6 billion in aid for Greece now. Oh, yeah, A, that means loan. Okay, loans through banking, which yes. is facilitated by attorneys. But this is during the reset now, so it's, it's interesting to see. Hmm. All of these loans, these loans are backed by the new product. Okay, well, let me read a little bit down here and um, let you elaborate for us then after we get some um, of the premise here. Greece is set for uh, to receive $4.6 billion from the International Monetary Fund after the institution's board on Friday signed off on the latest review of Greece's rescue package. This Bursement comes after the IMF and Greece European lenders finished analyzing Greece's progress under the 173 billion euro, 236 billion US, bailout in March, ending six months of protracted negotiations. Greece last got an IMF aid disbursement in July of 2013 of 2.3 billion. Uh, boy, so that's like one tenth. They get ten times more now. Right. IMF has so far lent Greece about 15.8 billion under a four-year program meant to help Athens recover from a sovereign debt crisis, rebuild its economy, and return to markets. Given the delay, 
with the fifth review, Greece should get the equivalent of three more disbursements this year spread out over any remaining reviews. That's beautiful to see. So the attorney has four years to pay that back. Well, I wonder what they're going to do to them to get them to uh, produce. It's interesting. Right. Okay. So what you're saying now is to look at this under the different schematic under the where in which um, through the agreed entry out of my court case found in the document uh, the uh, one entitled House of Lords Senate. See, it's uh, it's a. Uh, 313 uh, CVO52 uh, right House of Lords sent and, and and the agreed entry in there swap us the human beings for the attorneys and then the follow through was the um, August into September order on human trafficking and of course the requirement under the clearinghouse Secretary of State 38 U.S.C. subsection 108, which maintains the seven-year absence uh, uh, presumption of death. And what had happened is we came in and, and we said, hey, look, we're looking for some judges. We're looking for those who are not human trafficking. And at that time in August, uh, the uh, U.S. District Court judge Philip P. Simon came in and said, yeah, I'm human trafficking. There's a proper way and an improper way of human trafficking. And he had admitted uh, on evidence in a court record that he was human trafficking. And at that point in time, then that allowed us, the United States court, to declare him dead. Well, he evidenced so many things. Uh, it was just beautiful to see in one sense that he evidenced that uh, he wasn't a judge. Just a lat a tat. Right. Okay, he was just hanging in the background. I mean, he got recused, you know, and the, the court uh, documents, the yeah. docket even reflected that, which is oh, interesting. And then, you know, they signed another magistrate. Right. And then here comes Simon again. Oh, you guys was, are crazy. That was the funniest part is that, they, that there was another judicial assignment, and that other judge was actually a judge. He did not rule on anything and put his hand in there he let philip simon take the fall which was it was beautiful to see oh yeah i mean you know you may have to read this several times to get the gist of all the things that were evidence in this case but the human trafficking the genocide it's all it's it's evidence in the three different variants metasoma veta right over and over and that's the, that's their their schematic and of course their downfall is the compartmentalization. You know this one, uh, you kept smacking him with uh, you know uh, you know things against his title, and he came right back in there and thought he was a big boy to, to admit that he could human traffic. And it, that's what allowed the declaration of death because a judge is bound by judicial canon; they can only see evidence and rule accordingly. They're not allowed to human traffic. Right. That's act. what allowed us to uh, evidence that he's not a judge. And then, as with, you know, all the judges, it's the same thing since the 1789 Judiciary Act. There are no judges. They're right. just, they're just, it, it, you know, bankers up there uh, dealing with uh, negotiable instruments, which is the human being turned into these negotiable instruments of human trafficking. Right. And that, that was... And you guys call this downfall. the justice system. Right. And that was, of course, the downfall of Rome because he's a federal magistrate. And that's that's the whole schematic. The e forms of Rome actually put their hand in there and, and uh, fell down pretty high. i got another fine example of uh, how uh, it works out for citizens here now. Um, uh, over at LA again. LA, by the way, uh, n now they're going to be uh, uh, instituting drones in their uh, police force. Okay, they're so I mean, consenting. They're not rising up. No, they're not. But uh, over in LA, then a jail visitor gets a million dollars plus for uh, vicious beatdown by deputies. Now this guy was visiting his brother in. Uh, jail when when the, when the prison guards just beat the crap out of him. Gabriel um, uh, Carillo 
had gone to Men's Central Jail on February 26 of that year, that's uh, 2011, uh, to visit a younger brother arrested on suspicion of carrying concealed weapon, only to be beaten so severely by deputies that he had to get stitches over an eyebrow that topped an eye that had swollen shut. There was much blood on the floor, and Carrillo passed out at one point during the beating, only to awaken to more blows. The week his attorney announced the laborer was getting a uh, $1.175 million settlement from Los Angeles County, which runs the facility and employed the deputies. Following the beating, criminal charges against Carrillo were dismissed, and cops involved in the attack were charged as part of a federal case alleging civil rights violations, false arrest, and other counts. Grillo and his girlfriend say they inadvertently brought cell phones into the jail complex and that when their phone fell to the floor, deputies swarmed cuffing Carrillo. You know? Oh, and, and how long did this case go on? Yeah. So since the attorneys got how much money out of that? Three, yeah, it was three years there. Attorneys so cashed in. Gone, yeah. So $1.175 million, and he's likely to get 0.82% of that right. probably. Right. As uh, laid out in the um, uh, general uh, debenture uh, participation program. Okay, debenture participation program, and that's a debt secured by your own earning power. And part of his earning power is suing somebody else, and then the attorneys put on the show for three, six, seven, eight, nine years, and all that time when somebody's arguing under statute or legislation, uh, they're being held in contempt. So the attorney's making a dance. The judgment was already uh, facilitated at the inception by the insurer, and the attorney devises a schematic on how to get the most bang for their buck, how to take it back. Now, he admits to mouthing off about how things would be different if he wasn't in handcuffs, and that's when he says the cops swarmed him. Okay. Oh, yeah, you can't say anything um, bad to them cops, boy. You know, I mean, these cops have so much title. It's like, what? Question my authority, okay, Eric Cartman. Okay, Eric Cartman is like your typical uh, yes. Satan cop. Right, psychopath. That's right. And, um, you know, these are sheriff's deputies. Again, evidencing that the quote-unquote sheriffs are not stewards of humanity, but they are uh, uh, corporate policy enforcement thugs for the corporation known as United States of America. Right. And we need to note here that that type of sheriff, the office or title of sheriff that is not acting as a steward is a fiction and they were declared dead last year along with their handlers. Because those fictions, I couldn't find a sheriff. If you cannot find the steward of mankind, that thing is declared dead under 28, or, uh, 38 U.S.C. 10, subsection 108. And that's what it's all about. And, and concerning the citizen, if you're acting as a fiction, you're, there's a presumption that you're dead. Stop contracting and being a fiction. A fiction is something holding a business license to do business as a fictional title or description, such as a driver's license or a marriage license, or other contract with a government that's bankrupt. Oh, some more <coughs> news roundup here from sfgate.com. Ohio lawmaker charged with fraud appears in court Cincinnati. An Ohio lawmaker accused of misleading investors about a company's financial status and using their money for personal gain was in court again Thursday. At a short hearing in Hamilton County Court, Judge John Andrew West set a July 28th hearing for Representative Pete Back of Mason. Beck's trial is set for November 17th. The 61-year-old Beck, who was indicted in July, is accused of being part of an enterprise that misled investors, laundered money, and improperly diverted investors' money. Beck has pleaded not guilty to the charges and denies involvement. Beck lost his bid for re-election in May 6th primary. John Fussner, a former business partner, has agreed to testify against Beck as part, as, a, as part of a plea agreement he reached with prosecutors. 
Again, cannibalism, Revelation 19. It's the marriage feast here. Uh, yeah, you want to get a uh, overview of uh, how the police are uh, being the fall guys for these attorneys. Uh, just go over to policemisconduct.net, which is put out by the attorneys, the Cato Institute, and um, you can get all kinds of stories here. There's uh, just a couple here. i just read some headlines. Alexandria, Virginia, a deputy sheriff was arrested for sexually assaulting an inmate. Uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, update. Video of officers kicking a man on the ground made national news and triggered protests. Also launched a FBI investigation into the officer's conduct. City officials agreed to settle the man's a civil rights lawsuit for 198,000. Uh, LaVerge, Louisiana. Police are conducting an internal investigation to determine if officers use excessive force while trying to restrain a man after they responded to a report reported fight. Romulus, Michigan. A now former police chief pled guilty to racketeering, embezzlement, and misconduct charges. Prosecutors say the chief and detectives use drug forfeiture money to pay for prostitutes, alcohol, and marijuana to buy a tanning saloon for the chief's wife. Right, make sure that we identify the difference between the two. That's not an officer, that chief and the detectives are FBI agents. Right, so that's the federal state getting cannibalized by the national state in this instance. Right. Uh, Killing Alabama, a police officer was arrested on a grand jury indictment for domestic violence. Investigators said he bit his mistress on the nose during a fight. Oh. Odessa, Texas. Uh, update here. Now, former police officer who allegedly groped women during traffic stops has been indicted and fired. Good. Evansville, Indiana. A police department is investigating an off-duty officer's use of force on a 78-year-old man inside the lobby of a bank branch. Only investigating. He hasn't been charged yet? Mm, nope. Sick. Sherville, Indiana. Motorist whose blood alcohol level was below the legal limit filed $11 million $11 million federal lawsuit against uh, police used a catheter to forcibly obtain a urine oh, sample from him. That's sick. After being detained for about 45 right. minutes, he was taken to a hospital where he voluntary, voluntarily provided a blood sample that produced .07 blood alcohol content reading just under the legal limit of .08. The officer was unsatisfied with this result and demanded the man provide... Yeah. Quote unquote, voluntary Rape. urine sample Rape. with a catheter. Great. Just sick. Uh, another update in Kobuk, Alaska. Now, former police officer was sentenced to three years in jail for sending text messages asking a 12 year old girl for sex while on duty. How much time? Just 10 years? Yeah. Sick. 12, well, no, only three years. God. Yeah. They're going to play catch and release so he can do it again. Or harm somebody egregiously. Sick. These attorneys need to be gotten rid of. Palm Beach uh, County, Florida. A deputy was arrested after allegedly battering a five-year-old boy, leaving the child with hemorrhaging around the eyes and a swollen lip, according to a police report. Oh, my goodness. El, pa El Paso County, Colorado. County sheriff has refused to put himself on unpaid administrative leave or resign, the county commissioner asked him to step down. He's facing accusations of sex with subordinates, abusive treatment of employees, and dismantling oversight of the office budget. Now, here we have a corporate counsel attorney, yeah. and that cop probably has something on him. Yeah. So this, you know. We, we've been after that sheriff out there, the sheriffs out there, because they're not adhering to the public law, so. Whoever wants to be a fall guy gets This is a warning to you out there, Mr. Sheriff. Absolutely. I'm not going to be, be leaguer on it here, but um, <laughs> the public law agreed, agreed entry has got some uh, teeth, buddy. Yeah, Jesus so, will never speak your intent. You know, uh, let's see. Uh, Fort Smith, Oklahoma, police arrested another officer and his wife on several charges, including child endangerment and intoxication. Deputies said the officer pointed a gun at a five-year-old's head. Ugh. He has resigned. Columbia, South Carolina, an officer has been arrested in connection with a domestic incident involving his wife. Officials say he had threatened her and uh, stuck a gun in her face. Uh, DeKalb County, Georgia, county prosecutors say now former police officer has been sentenced on child molestation charges. The officer was sentenced to 10 years and is ordered to serve five of them in detention. What the hell was that? Five of them in detention? Where else is he going to be? 
<laughs> I don't know. Uh, Ottawa County, Ohio, uh, Ohio, and now former sheriff has been fined thousand dollars for misspending government funds. He pled guilty to impro improperly spending more than five thousand from the federal funds earmarked for law enforcement needs. San Francisco, California, two college students are taking the first steps towards filing a lawsuit against the city and county, saying they were the victims of police brutality. Lombok, California, Lompoc, a sergeant was arrested on suspicion of criminal threats and felony vandalism following a dispute at his home. Uh, let's see here. So, let's get to some goodies here, some good charges here while well, we've got time. Prosecutors wrap up case against former Rhode Island lawmaker charged with embezzlement. All right, here we go, lawmaker. Get on in there, Mr. Lawmaker. Providence, Rhode Island prosecution has wrapped up its embezzlement case against a former Rhode Island lawmaker. Prosecutors say Leo Medina, Medina of Providence pocketed $28,000 from a life insurance policy on a friend's daughter who died in 2007. The Provincial Journal reports a member of the State Police Financial Crimes Unit testified about Medina's bank records and an effort to show he took the money. Medina served one term as a Democrat state representative from Providence. He lost a bid for a second term in 2012. His trial will resume on Monday. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, they're just psychopaths. I mean, these are the people you're voting for. They're all like this. This is just coming out now. It's just coming out now. And you guys want to continue to vote for this stuff? Step out of the system. Indict them. Not impeach. Okay? Patriots in the uh, mainstream media is going to throw impeachment in your face. So, uh, that you know, those being impeached can just get a slap on the wrist and sneak out the back door and go on to bigger and better uh, activities. As they all do when they step out of government. It seems like they do more damage when they get out of government. Like uh, Henry Kissinger and... Oh, goodness. You know, all of, all of the, 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 the quote-unquote former presidents. Okay? Which are the uh, silver-toothed attorneys-in-chief. And, um, man, it just never ends. It just never ends uh, until you guys wake up and... Um, you know, quit being patriotic to the thing that through the National Security Act, Office of Population Affairs, and the FDA, and um, the uh, Department of uh, Health and Human Services is killing you. They're killing you. That's what. What? Why do you? Why do you think you see all this GMO food and stuff out there? Okay, because they're killing you. It's under uh, the uh, Office of Population Affairs policy. Local attorney arrested for DUI. This is in Richland, Washington. A prominent attorney was arrested on suspicion of DUI late Monday night in Richmond. Scott W. Johnson, 41, of Mendoza and Johnson, was observed by Richland PD driving on the wrong side of the road in Columbia Point Drive. When the police flashed their lights, he pulled over in the golf cart path and struck cement balusters. Police were initially tipped off that there was a car swerving onto oncoming lanes of traffic on George Washington Way. He was stopped at 11 p.m. Monday and booked into jail just before 3 a.m. Tuesday. Johnson was released later that day. Uh, he previously worked as a prosecutor for Benton County before going into private practice uh, with clients in criminal defense. Yeah, they love to defend criminals. Essex County Corrections Officer, ex-prosecutor, arrested for smuggling pot in the jail. This is a new work. Uh, two corrections officers and a former Essex County prosecutor were charged today with smuggling marijuana and cell phones into pretrial lockup for federal uh, inmates at the Essex County Jail, New York, federal prosecutors say. Uh, let's see. Officers, uh, corrections Officers Stephen Solomon, 26, of Irvington, and Channel uh, Les Pianis. Uh, 25 of Florham Park were charged with smuggling contraband, including cell phones, marijuana, into the New York facility. Solomon was arrested in his home uh, this morning, and Lespinasi was issued a summons to appear in court June 2nd. We'll be back with the Bon Rocco Show. Don't miss the Bon Rocco Show on Wednesday nights right here on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, Studio A. Thank you, Bo. Be well, everybody.